my joke. <laughs> yes. Uh, Unless you ask too many nasty questions, uh, it will be put online, I think. Yes. Is there a pointer? Uh, um, there's a stick here. Oh, good. OK, so thanks to Regua and all the organizers for putting together this very nice meeting. Um, so uh, this is some work that we are in the process of uh, finishing up. And I thought by giving this talk, it will help me finish it up. Uh, or maybe one of you will finish it off. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, so this is uh, you know, trying to understand two-dimensional quantum magnets, uh, various phenomena in two-dimensional quantum magnets within a single framework. Um, and uh, I think we have, uh, yeah, we're pretty pleased with the progress. And it's really due to these uh, three people. Uh, so Shui Yang Song is a graduate student. She's actually uh, in her f just finished her first year, uh, but she's really a uh, pretty accomplished uh, researcher. So Yin Chen is a professor at uh, Parameter Institute. And Chong Wang is also now a professor at Parameter Institute. Um, so this picture looks like uh, Central visiting Madame Tussauds. <laughs> 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 but it's not. That's the real person. I'm sure he'll have a statue. And both these guys will have their statues in Madame Tussauds one day. But for now, we have to do with the <laughs> Doesn't it look like that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let me first give you an overview of um, what I want to uh, talk about. Uh, so we will be interested in quantum magnets in two dimensions, so spin a half, <coughs> typically on various lattices. Okay, so that will be the slightly different thing about this talk. We won't restrict our attention, as people usually do, to one or the other lattice. Uh, this is the favorite square lattice, uh, <coughs> the typical kind of magnetic order that you get, nail order. Um, but uh, we believe that as you change parameters, uh, you can also end up in such a phase, a columnar uh, valence bond solid, a spin singlet ground state, but that doubles the unit cell. Similar kind of orders are proposed for um, you know, the triangular lattice, but now it's not collinear. It's a coplanar, 120 degree order, very well known. And the VBS order that's naturally associated on the triangular lattice may be a little bit l less well known. It's quite complicated. Uh, it's got 12 sites in the unit cell. I'm not even sure this is a, the right picture. I couldn't find a good picture of this uh, order. Um, and uh, there are similar things on the Kagome. Uh, so there's sort of a dichotomy over here. These are, this is a bipartite lattice. Uh, you can think of collinear states for the honeycomb lattice as well. And uh, there's a Kagome, which is more like this. There's some sort of a 120 degree order there. Uh, and there are valence bond solid states there as well. Uh, so usually, these four lattices are all treated separately. Um, sometimes we think of the bipartite lattices together. And uh, there's a nice uh, proposal to try to unify uh, at least these two uh, sets of phases on different bipartite lattices. You can write a single set of variables, so-called deconfined quantum critical point, where by tuning that theory uh, by parameter, you can either end up in the nail phase or in the valence bond solid phase. Can you do that also for the honeycomb? Uh, but there's been no real attempt to unify all of these things together. Uh, may maybe there have been some. but. Uh, um, I'll try to say that we have made some progress. And the thing that is really going to unify these together is the so-called Dirac uh, U1 Dirac spin liquid. Okay, We'll see that on all of these lattices, you can define a U1 Dirac spin liquid. Um, and we'll see how the, uh, you know, the different physics you see over here, also things that you don't see, I haven't put up the Kagome, um, uh, can all be obtained from this single theory. And the main. A uh, new ingredient that we are going to um, uh, introduce, or, uh, or rather analyze, is really the uh, symmetry properties of a particular excitation in this U1 Dirac spin liquid called the magnetic monopole. Okay, so these are slightly difficult to analyze, then, uh, or at least a little bit abstract. Uh, so unlike uh, usual um, operators in a field theory, you know, you write down a field theory; it has some fields. And uh, most of the operators are just polynomials in those fields. Okay, but we'll see this magnetic monopole is not. Uh, there are familiar analogies. You know, when you bosonize 1D, there are similar things that happen. But that makes that a little bit more abstract. And you have to work a little bit harder uh, to analyze those symmetries. So basically, technically, that's what we did. We analyzed the symmetry properties of these monopoles 
once you do that carefully on the different lattices, you see why they are different, why the phenomenology on the different lattices are different, and we're able to recover all these different pictures that I, I showed you before. Okay, so uh, we'll see that it captures the order both on the bipartite lattices as well as on, on these non-bipartite lattices. Uh, and then you can ask what's different, why is the phenomenology so different on bipartite and non-bipartite within this framework? You know, you have one framework to talk about both. You can ask why things are different. And uh, there'll be a very simple answer that these bipartite lattices always have one of these monopole excitations that simply doesn't transform under the symmetries. Okay, and uh, we'll see that that, uh, at least we conjecture that that means the, these U1 spin liquids we write down with fermions is actually a different way of, uh, is ju just this deconfined criticality in, in disguise. Okay, now on non-bipartite lattices, it turns out this is not true. There is no trivial monopole. Okay, and uh, one of the physical consequences of that, which we are quite excited about, is that um, this, uh, this Dirac spin liquid is actually more stable uh, is expected to be more stable. Unlike over here, uh, you know, if you have a trivial monopole, you're allowed to add that to the Lagrangian, and it's very likely to be relevant. Um, uh, whereas over here, for these non-bipartite case, um, you know, you're not allowed to do that. There is some non-trivial symmetry quantum numbers associated with the monopole. It's more likely to be a stable phase. So, so, so for both cases, you are talking about n equals four speed. Yes. Uh, it'll, f it'll imply a flow away from this U1 Dirac spin liquid. Yeah, right, but, but, the, but the symmetry will still be SU4. But the Nafanko at the most has SO5 symmetry. Well, so it's, it's in your paper. <laughs> Wait, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the monopoles. Is SU4 in there or not? So the monopoles. Yeah, it's trivial under. It's trivial under the physical symmetries, okay, so there's no real SU4 symmetry. Um, okay, so I think one of the mo main conclusions we have is that um, uh, you know the um, these Dirac spin liquids. It may be worthwhile looking for it more carefully on the triangular lattice. In fact, just the regular and the nearest neighbor triangular lattice may have some signatures uh, of this Dirac spin liquid. Okay, of course, we know it's ordered. But it may not be very far away from this Dirac spin liquid. Well, two questions. I'm unfamiliar with the terminology. What does non trivial monopole mean? Um, I'll try to explain that better, but basically, this is an operator. Uh, and you can ask, there are physical symmetries. For example, you have spin rotation symmetry, you have lattice symmetries. And you can ask how this physical operator transforms under those symmetries. Mm -hmm. If it transforms as the identity representation, mm -hmm. that's, I will call that a trivial monopole. And if it is transforms non-trivially, that's the non-trivial one. And it, I, operationally, what it implies is I cannot add that to my Hamiltonian. So what you mean is typically what happens is that only multiple monopole events are allowed. Yes. Mean, yeah. So that Roughly the speaking. Symmetry is broken down to a discrete Very good. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's some caveat there, but I, I won't. Uh, yeah. We're talking about like the simple monopoles, and sometimes you can write down the you know, combinations of the monopole and other fields which may be allowed, but uh, they're less relevant. Sorry, uh, could you explain again the origin of this emergence of O distribution? Yeah, I'll, I'll, it, it needs a few, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is by no means the, begin, the, the first work on this. It builds on a lot of other things, uh, a lot of other papers. Uh, <coughs> This is just a subset. Um, so this is one of the very nice papers that began this uh, field um, in you know, looking at these things carefully. But it didn't look at uh, magnetic monopoles. Okay? But um, uh, one of the first papers to look carefully at magnetic monopoles was this very nice paper by Jason Alessia. Um, then there's a recent paper by Chenka, which we were very inspired by, uh, look, trying to apply these methods to the triangular lattice. Uh, and then this other paper, very beautiful paper on dualities of deconfined critical points, and this paper by Yuan Ming Lu. Okay, so I'll, um, I, I don't think I'll have a very good survey of the history, but these were very important for at least for us uh, papers for us. Okay, so this paper used the U1 spin liquid uh, as a mother of many many of these competing orders, but only on the square lattice. 
Okay, so we want to use do something similar. We want to use the U1 Dirac spin liquid to get uh, competing orders, but not just on the square, but on different lattices. Okay, so one of my collaborators suggested we call this the grandmother <laughs> of competing orders. <laughs> Okay, so this is grandmother theory, we can <laughs> GM theory. Okay, so I have to introduce some of these things. It's slightly, uh, unfortunately, going to be slightly technical talk, uh, but hopefully this introduction will bring people up to speed. Okay, so I want to give you an introduction to these U1 Dirac spin liquids, how these um, Dirac fermions emerge, and uh, these two kind of operators, their mass terms, and uh, the magnetic monopoles. Okay, and for that, I'll do that on the blackboard. Um, and uh, maybe I'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes on this. And when we are done with this, I'll tell you about our analysis of these uh, monopole quantum numbers. Okay. Okay, so um, I think I need some chalk. Um, and there it is. Great. Okay, so the simplest setting to introduce these Dirac spin liquids is let me do the honeycomb ladders because everyone knows the band structure on the honeycomb ladders. Right? Um, and um, I'm thinking of a spin model. So at every side of the honeycomb ladders, there is a spin a half. And think of the usual um, Heisenberg antiferromagnet. The treatment we'll give here is not going to be energetically correct. So the, we'll write on a mean field theory, which is not connected to the usual ground state, which is actually the nail state. But uh, you know what I'm doing. I'm trying to write down a slave particle theory. Um, OK, so we introduce these fermions. They're really electrons. If they were had um, you know, their charge degree of freedom, uh, you can make a spin out of them. So every course of fermions. Um, but there's a constraint on every side. You have exactly one fermion that gives you the spin model. And you can write down a mean field decoupling of this term, which is an interaction of these uh, fermions. Uh, and that, that can um, you know, be written as just some quadratic hopping model um, on the um, Honeycomb lattice, uh, but with a gauge uh, gauge field. Okay, so there's some gauge field that is now allowed admitted on the links uh, because the charge of this thing is not a physical object. You want to gauge that, and it, you have some hopping on this honeycomb lattice. Can we all know what the band structure of that hopping is? Uh, so this was real space, um, and you can go to the Pilva zone. Um, So this is k space, and you have these Dirac points, which are at um, the k and minus k points. Okay, so you end up with the Dirac uh, theory, and the filling of this is on average one per side. So you fill up exactly to neutrality, and the low energy uh, mean field Hamiltonian. Uh, is just these Dirac fermions. So, okay, so there's right, left, and there is spin. Um, and in the right variables, you can integral over space. Okay, so you end up with these fermions that are four component. Um, so let me write it as a um, the psi right up, psi right down, psi left up, psi left down. Okay, so if you like, there's a, a index one to four, and this is that's why this is called NF equal to four. Um, you know, flavors. So these are going to be our flavors. Um, and when I wrote this down, I didn't have the gauge field. Uh, but of course, we have to int uh, include fluctuations of this gauge field. Um, and that will simply convert these 
derivatives into covariant derivatives. Okay, so that's how you end up with QED3. So this is NF equal to four quantum electrodynamics, theory of photons and fermions. Um, but in the three is for the two plus one dimensions and NF equal to four is the number of flavors, okay, two component flavors. Okay, so that's how you get these. Uh, this is what we're gonna call the U1 Dirac spin liquid. Um, Okay, so, um, so one of the things you can analyze over here, is this a stable phase? This is gapless. Um, so the first instability you could write down is a mass term. Uh, you can ask, are the mass terms allowed? Uh, we'll go through that exercise. Uh, so the Dirac mass, you can write it in a uh, kind of a compact uh, form, uh, which is to use these, uh, uh, you know, psi bar, um, which is just psi dagger times uh, mu z. Uh, and then there is a flavor matrix that you can write down. This is four, there are four choices. There are 16 of these flavor matrices in all. Uh, and you can write them as products of, um, you know, Pauli matrices that act on the valley, the right and left, we'll call it valley, uh, and the spin. Um, so this, for example, there is M00, which is the identity for both. Okay, that's a special mass term that gives you the quantum hall. Uh, but the other mass terms all involve flavors. So this one, for example, is just the spin, uh, the identity in the flavor space, um, and you know, in general, this MAB is some. Um, let me call it tau A. So tau is in the valley space, and sigma is in the spin space. Okay, so, um, so those are the mass terms, and we'll see in a little bit for the other cases that we're interested in. Uh, and also for this, you know from graphene, all of these mass terms are forbid forbidden by symmetry. You cannot add them in the Lagrangian. For example, this term psi bar psi uh, actually breaks time reversal symmetry. Of course, that's why it gives you quantum hall. But since you have time reversal symmetry in your Hamiltonian, you're not allowed to add that term. Okay, and so on, all these other terms. Spin rotation forbids this, um, and you know, Valley symmetry forbids that, and so on. Okay, so all of these uh, mass terms are uh, disallowed, um, you know, which means that the this most obvious perturbation that kills this phase is not allowed. Um, <coughs> okay, so this is how, how things work out for this, uh, for the honeycomb lattice. You can ask, what about the other lattices we talked about? Um, some of those cases are a little surprising that you have Dirac points. Um, so um, let me just quickly, so what are the band structures like? Um, so on the square lattice, uh, you can begin, this I'm sure everyone knows, you can begin with pi flux in every square. Okay, so called pi flux spin liquid. Um, so this could be a U1 spin liquid like that, but it has an extra symmetry. So it's often thought of as an SU2, um, you know, Dirac spin liquid. Uh, you can perturb this by adding some flux uh, that is staggered. Uh, that's called the staggered flux. Uh, and all of these, uh, this has uh, Dirac points if you solve for the band structure. So it's just like um, that honeycomb lattice model. Uh, so it turns out in the triangular lattice, you can also write down a Dirac spin liquid, but maybe somewhat surprising. Um, but what you do over here is that you introduce pi flux in the up triangle, let's say, and zero flux in the down triangle. Okay, so this is a, a particular choice of those hopping matrix elements. A priori, it looks like it breaks some symmetry. It seems to single out the up rather than the down. Okay, but this is gauge flux. And you can make a particle hole transformation on these F fermions that can be part of your symmetry operator uh, that allows you to rotate by the 60 degrees and flip the sign of the flux. Okay, so in fact, you can keep all symmetries at the level of the physical spins, 
and you can end up getting a Dirac spin liquid. Okay, so this also has some Dirac spin. Okay, and this is going to be one of the main focus of our talk. I don't know who came up with this. Th I learned about it in this paper by Yuan Ming Lu. Okay, um, okay. It's, it's also n equal to 4 in that? Yes, it's also n equal to 4, yeah. So all of these are going to be nf equal to 4, and the physical differences are going to appear in the way the symmetry is packaged into these, um, into these fields. Um, you're saying if you raise this, it looks like the pi flux on the square, but without the square lattice symmetry. So without, uh, symmetry. Oh. it's on some ladders, yeah. And, uh, also on square lattice, I mean, for arbitrary data, is it based for your time reversal? Yes. So again, time reversal is implemented in a strange way. You do time reversal, you flip the flux, but then you can also do a particle hole transformation and flip it back. So this also doesn't look translationally symmetric. It looks like the flux is different here and there. But when you translate, you also do particle hole symmetry, and you can recover the. Thing. So you, you're allowed, um, you know, a bigger set of symmetry transformations than you're allowed for electrons. If these were electrons, all of these would break symmetry. Where is the point? Okay, so uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, so uh, you mean for this one, of course. Um, so let's um, pick a four-site unit cell. So you don't have to do that, but let me pick a four-side unit cell. I think I have a picture of this. Um, and um, so then what happens is that this, the original Brillouin zone looks like this. The new Brillouin zone is like that. It's um, half this linear size, so quart quarter of four sides unit cell. And the Dirac point is here. <laughs> So all Dirac, both the Dirac fermions are there. So that looks horribly not symmetric, right? So you can say, what if I rotate? Um, there are three of these M points. What if I rotate it? But it turns out the rotation has to be followed by a gauge transformation, which gives it a boost uh, by pi zero. So you come back here. Um, Which one, this one? Um, OK, so when you implement lattice symmetries, actually, let me do it for this one. It's a little easier here. Okay. So this is a staggered flux where every placket has a different opposite flux. Is this also Yeah, so pi plus delta and pi minus delta. And you're saying this uh, the Dirac cone is stable under that delta? Yeah. Something happens to it, it becomes anisotropic, but it remains a Dirac cone. No, 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 arbitrary delta. I mean, OK, if you make it very large, you may you, you preserve the gaplessness of the drag point. You don't open a gap. You could maybe flatten it or do something like that. But um, uh, you, you don't, um, OK, so why does this not break symmetry? That was the question, right? OK. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a singular point, yeah. You're switched off some hopping. Okay. So you, but you get a, you know, a gapless uh, line then, right? That's the usual uh, square lattice hopping problem. You get a gapless line. That's when you tune the velocity of these drag fermions to 0. That's an unfortunate choice. Uh, OK, but, so, so you're saying apart from that? Yeah, apart uh, from that, yes. Can you explain then why is it? Uh, uh, yeah, why is it translationally symmetric? So, you know, when you have these fermions, um, you can make this um, combination. Yeah, and uh, you know, when you usually, when if these are electrons, you're just supposed to implement your translations on these on these operators. Mm -hmm. But here, I can make any. Uh, I can add to it symmetric transformations. I can add to it transformations that leave my spin operators invariant, because this is just some fake variables I'm using. One viewpoint is some fake variables to get the spin physics. So if I make a transformation on this that leaves the spin physics invariant, mm -hmm. it's legal. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you can do is a particle hole transformation. You can take f up to f down dagger. But is that charge conjugation? Yeah, charge conjugation, yeah. Okay. And obviously, charge conjugation is going to uh, flip the flux. But it's not going to do anything to the spin. 
So if I take f up to f down dagger and f down to minus f up dagger, you can verify that this all, these will give you the same spin as this. That's right, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but here I don't see it. Uh, here? How can you, how can you do that here? Because you would just flip pi to minus pi, that's the equivalent to pi. Uh, no, no, no. So this is a triangle over here. Mm -hmm. So if you flip the sign of the hopping on the triangle, it changes pi to 0. So the flux is the product of the hopping strengths, the phase of that. Mm -hmm. So if I change the sign, it's different between a square and a triangle. Change the sign over here, you get an overall minus sign. That's pi, pi or 0. So charge conjugation takes this from pi 0 to 0 pi, which is exactly what you want to do for rotation. OK, so all good questions. Um, so now let me talk about monopoles. OK, so there's an additional excitation in this theory, uh, which is a little bit subtle, and it could be missed at uh, first sight. Um, so you have this magnetic flux. Um, so we said that there's this little a, the gauge field, two-dimensional gauge field. Um, so curl of little a is some magnetic flux. Um, and the theory as written, as written up there, actually implies a conservation of magnetic flux. Okay, so if I look at the integral of magnetic flux on uh, uh, a surface, so at some equal time surface, um, I do 2x, this is a constant. Okay, that's what this theory implicitly um, you know, has, um, has incorporated. Um, once you fix the magnetic flux in a, in a sheet, it stays in, uh, independent of time. Okay, but that's a fake symmetry. We don't have such a conservation in our original theory. This is a U1 symmetry. It, it, uh, let me call it U1M for magnetic. Uh, there's U1 magnetic symmetry in this microscopic theory, um, in the, sorry, in this field theory. Um, which has no analog in real life. Okay? So we have to, to be a faithful theory, we need to get rid of this U1 symmetry. And the way in which you do that is that you allow for events uh, where this magnetic flux will tunnel uh, into nothing, basically. Okay, so okay, so these are points in space-time, so instantons. Okay, where the magnetic flux goes, 2 pi of magnetic flux just disappears, basically, okay, or appears. Okay, and those are really magnetic monopole events. Okay, so there's some operator, let me call it M, M dagger, if you like. There's M and M dagger, um, which introduce these monopoles and take them out at some point in space and time. Okay, so the weird thing about this monopole is that you cannot write it as a polynomial in terms of those fields. Okay, it's not just some product of fermion fields or product of those um, of the gauge potentials. Um, it's really something that is, you know, inserts some magnetic flux or takes it out at some point in space. But it is a local operator. Okay, you can write out an explicit form for this. It's the exponential of the electric field uh, times the configuration that you want to implement. Okay, it's a local operator. Um, so very different from things like vortices um, that, that arise in duality. So this eventually, physically, this is going to be something like, you know, maybe a spin operator, product of spin operator, or something like that. It has a very exotic looking uh, form over here, but actually it's just some very simple physical operator, which, and what exactly it is depends on symmetries. Okay, so one analogy that may be useful, um, Actually, let me see how am I doing on time. Not very well. Um, so maybe I should just briefly mention this analogy. You know, if you were to write down a theory for the one-dimensional Bose-Hubbard model. Okay, let's say you have bosons in 1D and a lattice. You have a superfluid state. You have an uh, insulating state. Insulators, when the, the bosons are fixed on the sides, you may write down a Hamiltonian, which is just in terms of the phase degree of freedom. And so you have some Bose-Hubbard model. So some Ni squared charging energy and some hopping, cosine of phi i minus phi j. So those are the phases of your bosons. And you may be tempted to just write something like, this is the, the dual, um, OK, 
in that gradient uh, thing, and then you can expand this, and you can get something like dx phi squared. Yeah, sorry. Um, that's right. So that's the Hamiltonian. And this is maybe I'm writing things discrete. So this is phi i minus phi i plus one. Uh, so that looks like some harmonic chain. That will describe the superfluid, but it won't describe the Morton slater field. And the way in which you get the Morton slater is you realize that there are actually instantons where this phase, so in this theory, the phase, when you integrate it over a line, um, so the closed integral of gradient of phi is a constant, independent of time in this theory. Okay, but we know actually this is not, that's not a physical symmetry. The phase can wind. And the way in which it does that is that there's a vortex, let's say, inside that tunnels out. Okay, the vortex, there's a phase slip event, and that changes this uh, integral of gradient of phi uh, by some integers, 2 pi times an integer. Okay, and those events you can introduce into this Hamiltonian as some uh, instantons again. So there's some additional piece, and that's how you get this cosine of theta. The conjugate field appears. In, the, uh, in this description, the sine gordon description of the post hubbard model. And when this becomes relevant and large, you end up getting many of these vortex events, you end up getting the insulator. Okay, and if, you are, if you have a partial filling, it turns out not allowed to write this term because it breaks symmetry and you have to write cosine of two times theta. Okay, that's the sort of this umklapp term that you get, for example, in the spin a half chain. And that arises because of some Berry's phase effects of these vortices. Okay, we'll see something very similar happening. Instead of, what, uh, instead of these vortex tunneling events, we'll have these monopole tunneling events. They'll have Berry phases associated with them, and sometimes you're not allowed to add it to the Lagrangian like this. Okay, and um, <coughs> uh, that's sort of the analogy. And again, over here, you can see you cannot write it in terms of the, the fields phi in some you know, simple polynomial form. Okay, so there's one additional complication that we have, which is we have Dirac fermions present along with these monopoles. Okay, so when you talk about monopoles in the presence of Dirac fermions, uh, you end up getting these zero modes. Okay, so that's the last thing I want to uh, mention. Um, So if you really want to treat these magnetic monopoles properly in a theory which has these Dirac fermions, uh, you need to take into account these uh, zero modes. Okay, so all you do is you have this theory. Um, you imagine a point in time when you introduce some magnetic flux. Um, okay, so this is before and after, no magnetic flux. You have these Dirac points. You introduce magnetic flux. Let's say it's uniformly distributed, 2 pi of flux. Okay, so this is the integral of... Okay, so this is the magnetic monopole event. And we know that if I put in 2 pi of flux uh, or any integer amount of flux on a drag fermion, I get this Landau levels. Um, and I'll get a zero Landau level. Okay, and I'll get one per Dirac fermion. Okay, you just put in magnetic flux on Dirac fermion, you get a zero Landau level. And those are low energy, you have to keep track of that. Okay, so uh, in this problem, I have four of them. I get four of these lambda level, uh, zero modes. Okay, I have stuff underneath, which I'm not going to talk about, which are all filled. And I have states above. Again, I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, I just have these four zero modes, and I can choose to occupy or not these zero modes. Okay, so these zero modes can be labeled as they're either right spin up or spin down, or left spin up or spin down. And it turns out to be gauge invariant, as you might guess. You have to fill half of them. Okay, so there are in all six different magnetic monopoles you can write down. Okay, so therefore choose two. Okay, for example, you can fill uh, spin up and spin up on the right and spin up on the left. That's a spin triplet. Magnetic monopole. 
So there are three of them. So there'll be three spin triplet okay, magnetic monopoles, and there'll be three spin singlet uh, magnetic monopoles. And these are complex operators. Okay, you can create them. You can insert flux or take out flux. They're charged under the U1 magnetic symmetry. So they come as with or, with or without a dagger. Okay, so in, in all, if you want to count them all, there are six of them. Six plus six, so there are 12 of them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the charge over here is actually actually gate charge. Okay. So it's completely crucial we maintain zero gate charge condition, and by symmetry you have to do half. Okay. So the magnetic monopole operators are going to come like in the sets of six, three spin and three singlet. Okay. And uh, how the symmetries act on the magnetic monopoles is going to be a crucial ingredient okay, in in getting all these different orders. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you can write this out more explicitly. I won't do that right now. Again, the next question is, uh -huh. is why don't you do the example for how we cut the integer of 5 to 5? Yes, yeah. Okay. So if you have two, two, two magnetic flux quanta, mm -hmm. you'll get eight of these states, and you have to half fill. Mm -hmm. So it's eight choose four. And it gets rapidly gets very complicated. Um, so one of the I inputs is actually that if you're looking at a conformal field theory like this, you want Dirac spin liquid, uh, the higher weight magnetic monopoles have higher scaling dimension. And there's a bulk, uh, there's an operator state correspondence where you think of a sphere, you put magnetic flux on the sphere, and the energy of that configuration corresponds to the scaling dimension. Take a unit radius sphere, put in magnetic flux of 2 pi uniformly, fill the zero modes, calculate the energy, and that corresponds to the scaling dimension of the operator. Of course, you have more flux, more things, you expect higher, um, higher scaling dimensions. Um, okay, so that is like the, the overview. So sorry, I'm kind of running late, but any questions about that? Um, okay. Um, Okay, so now that we know about magnetic monopoles, and particularly magnetic monopoles in this U1 Dirac spin liquid, where there are several of these um, varieties, we can ask what their monopole quantum numbers are, and we can use that to tie it into uh, the different kinds of orders we get on these different lattices. Okay, so, uh, so we'll sort of do an exercise. Okay, we'll actually show how we get this particular order on the square lattice. This won't be very exciting, but I'll go over it as a um, you know, just for show you how it does, how, how this works, and uh, then I'll show you how this works on the triangular lattice where it's more non-trivial. Okay, so on the, just to contrast these two, the order parameters here, nail order is like, um, um, it's at wave vector pi pi, and it's just a collinear order, so you just specify one spin vector. Okay, but if you look at the 120 degree order that occurs on the triangular lattice, um, this is really a coplanar, it's a spiral order, so it has some other wave vector, uh, not time reversal invariant wave vector. And to specify the spiral order, you need two vectors. You need to specify the plane. Okay? So you can think of it as a complex vector, if you like. You know, psi 1 plus i psi 2, uh, that defines the plane where you get the spiral order. Okay, so uh, sorry, just um, well, I didn't have that on my slide. Um, similarly, this valence bond solid pattern, we can write on an order parameter, which is basically the um, you can write down uh, wave vectors pi zero, as you can see, and there's a two vector, the components of pi zero and zero pi. They're two real numbers. You can combine them, if you like, into a complex number, or you can think of it as a two vector in this plane. Okay? Uh, but again, it turns out this order over here on the triangular lattice, the so-called square root 12 by square root 12 valence bond solid order, um, it, it, is, it is sort of like this 120 degree state. You need to specify two vectors to uh, fix it, fix it to orthogonal vectors. Okay, so it's sort of a complex three vector. Okay, so this distinction we'll see really comes about because the magnetic monopoles transform differently in these two Dirac spin liquids. So okay. yeah, so we'll we'll V2, yeah. So actually, how, how, how do I connect this to the Python picture of the, you know, both are right that you want that would be two spin liquid, right? Yes. Which one? Uh, the, the Bison Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you, you have to fractionalize this into y zones. Okay, so um, so now, uh, okay, so sorry about these, uh, this <laughs> yeah, this slide is a bit messy, but um, what people have done is, for example, in this paper, they have seen how symmetries act on these different operators. So uh, the first thing I said was there are these fermion bilinears, which correspond to mass terms, right? And you have to make sure they're forbidden, and in fact, this paper analyzed the symmetry of these different fermion bilinears um, and uh, let me just point out some that, uh, that look familiar. So this is a product of some spin operator and tau z, this fermion bilinear, and it has the exact same transformation properties as the nail phase. Okay, of course, the nail phase breaks some symmetry, so it's not, you're not allowed to add this directly into the Hamiltonian. Uh, it could be spontaneously generated. So, so, sorry, so, so, so the square axis, do you want to decrease both orthogonal, scale orthogonal, or, or it doesn't matter anymore? So it's not described like that. So maybe you should say it's collinear there. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so don't use that description on the square ladders. It's better to just think of it as a complex vector, which is yeah. psi 1 plus uh, 2 vector. Just sorry, just a complex scalar. Okay. Yeah, they were in which was numbers, right? Yeah, they're numbers for the square ladders, yes. Yeah, so you have got to be a little careful. So you'll see that that distinction, whether it's a complex vector or a complex scalar, depends on the monopoles. So we'll see how that comes out. But there's no confusion how to describe the valence bond solid order on the square lattice. It's just a complex scalar, right? Um, okay, so um, uh, so then there are these other fermion bilinears which correspond to the valence bond solid order that corresponds to this tau x and tau y. Um, <coughs> okay, and the picture over here how do you go from the U1 spin liquid to the ordered states is that maybe the interactions are so strong that you spontaneously generate a mass term. It's not present in the theory to begin with. The strong interactions you spontaneously, it's called chiral symmetry breaking. You break some symmetry, generate a mass term, um, and then you end up, for example, if you generate this particular mass term, you've broken exactly the right symmetries to get the nail state. Okay, so people would conclude that, yeah, this is the nail state, that's it. We have found the nail state as an instability. But it's not quite right, because you still have photons in your theory. Can you need confinement to get rid of the photons, so the confinement is, occurs with monopoles, so it's actually uh, very important that you analyze what the monopole quantum numbers are. So, well, th that's kind of backwards, right? We want to start with the U1 spin liquid. We want to find an instability of the U1 spin liquid. And we want to call that theory the, nail, the, the resulting state the nail state. So then it has to match all the properties of the nail state. But if you take this theory without monopoles, um, there is an instability where you can gap out all the fermions, but they're not confined. Okay, uh, and in particular, there's still a photon that's flying around in the gapless mode, which has nothing to do with the, um, the gapless, the Goldstone mode of this uh, nail, uh, nail order. So you need to confine that for which you need monopoles. And it could be that once you introduce these, you get a different order. Okay, it could further break the symmetry. You may not end up in the nail state. Okay, so that's a worry with, with this picture. So you know, people didn't take, uh, not everyone in the field took it very seriously to say that this, uh, the Dirac spin liquid on the square lattice, the so-called staggered flux state, was really a representation of the nail order. Okay, because how, you know, there's all these different um, steps that you have to go through. Okay, so you really need a calculation of the monopole quantum numbers. Part of this calculation is very easy. You know how these fermions transform. So when you fill up these zero modes, you know exactly that part of the transformation is quite easy to calculate. In fact, it was calculated before. Okay, the part that is non-trivial is that when the symmetry acts on these um, monopole operators, there's something special about them. They actually change the magnetic charge, and there can be a piece that uh, is related to that, that you are completely blind to if you look only at the fermions. Fermions don't have change the magnetic charge. So they're not sensitive to that part. Okay, so you need to do a calculation uh, of that part of the monopole transformation. Okay, and uh, that's going to be crucial. And the way we did it um, is to do, first we did it numerically. So the last part of my talk, if I ever get there, is to show you you can do all of this very simply analytically. Okay, but uh, 
We just did it numerically, take magnetic flux of two pi on the torus with this Dirac spin liquid. Um, we put in some, you can actually put in some mass term that gaps out the fermions but doesn't break any symmetry. Just translate the state and take the overlap. Okay, so you may have to do a gauge transformation to keep this a symmetry. Just translate and take the overlap. Uh, b translate by one unit, you get a, a number. It's an amplitude and a phase. You extract this phase. If this amplitude is not small enough, you can extract this phase. Okay, and um, uh, what we find is that for the square lattice, the staggered flux state or the pi flux state, uh, this phase factor that you get is pi. So the, the monopole quantum number is pi for translations in x and y direction. So it is wave vector pi pi. If you do it for the triangular lattice, you find this uh, phase factor is 2 pi over 3. Okay, and the nice thing about these numerics is that this amplitude actually increases as you go to larger system sizes. Okay, so that tells you this is probably okay. Usually overlaps decrease when you go to larger system size. So it's the, the calculate what the size is, don't take the, the monopole. Yes, that's right, yeah. And, uh, so you put in some mass term to pick some monopole, let's yeah. say the quantum spin hall, mm -hmm. which doesn't break the translation symmetry. Yeah, yeah, so you take, if you like, the quantum spin hall band structure, um, fill, you know, half filling, uh, put in magnetic flux of two pi. So now, you, you know, you might say, oh, okay, now this looks translationally invariant. Uniform flux, let me just read off the quantum numbers of the ground state. Now it turns out it's a little subtle on the torus. Uh, you don't actually have translation symmetry. It looks translationally symmetric. But if you look at the Wilson loop operator around this loop, that changes from uh, cut to cut because there's a flux in between those two Wilson loops. Mm -hmm. So there's a subtle breaking of translation symmetry that goes away in the thermodynamic limit. Wilson loops get very big and you can't see it. That's why we kind of recover this. So you have to do this brute force numerics. Take the state, translate, take the overlap cannot read off from quantum numbers. What's G? So G is, you know, when you do the translation, the mean field may not be uh, invariant. You may have to do a gauge transformation, so you do that to, this is the real translation operator. Okay. So it's supposed to be true to the monopole. I thought it's supposed yes. to be valid singly. Yes. So shouldn't it be translation invariant? So that part of it is translationally invariant. So the zero mode part is translationally invariant. Yeah. But there's also a part that comes from the Dirac C. And that is the part we are after. That is really the subtle part. Okay. So if you like, you have, um, you know, to be more formal, which may actually make sense to you better, uh, you have some symmetric group, and you want to embed it in the symmetry of your field theory. Your field theory has symmetry of U1, M, times the flavor symmetry, which is SU4. Okay. And this part, G, being embedded into flavor symmetry, we are very sensitive to because we know exactly how the fermions transform. But if this embedding actually involves this U1 M part, you never see it when you look at the fermions. You have to look at the monopoles. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we find that there is a such a part. And this part for translations, for the square lattice is pi pi, and for the triangular lattice is two pi over three. So, well, but, but suppose, suppose all the phases come from Dirac fermion, then that would say they are universal. But if uh, things come from below Dirac fermion, then it is still universal. That's what I'll try to convince you. Yeah, it it depends on some details, but it depends on the UV completion. But in a very particular, it's it's sort of rigid. So actually, Jason Alessia, this uh, result is actually and he did it for this square lattice. It's in agreement with his. And what he showed in that paper, and what's easy to reproduce, is that this phase, uh, you know, a priori you can fix that phase to be one of a few options from symmetry. Uh, so it's not random. That phase is not any old number. But you have to choose between the different options, and there's a very physical meaning to what these different options correspond to for the UV completion. So in our theory, we have not just the field theory, we have the full UV completion, right? We have the band structure of the spin-ons for the entire band. Yeah. And it's related to some property of that, which I'll get to if I have time. Probably won't. Just one step back to mm -hmm. so I understand. So you're doing numerics uh, directly for the tight binding model yes. of fermions. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's a bit illegal. I don't have gauge fluctuations in it. The spirit is I'm thinking of large n and then setting n equal to 4 or whatever. So gauge fluctuations are weak in the limit of large number of fermion degrees of freedom. Act like it's a free fermion problem and hope as I reduce the number of fermions that doesn't suddenly jump to some other value. Okay, again, because it's rigid, you, you have faith in this kind of approximation. There's only a few choices. So, yeah. And the mass term is not just is, um, is implemented for all the states even below the fermion. Yeah. Yeah, you just put in a mass term in the okay. thing. Uh, it could be very small. 
just to regularize this. So this side is data determinant at all spin wave function? Like but the one particle wave function. It's not the spin wave function, yeah. You could also do it with some Gutsula projected version. We did something like that with Yingran many years back. That's not highly non-trivial. This is a much simpler calculation. Okay, so it turns out this agrees with Jason Alessia's. So Jason did it on the cylinder where it's easier to do. But it turns out, although that answer is the same, doing it on the cylinder is dangerous. Okay, the cylinder has edge states. Uh, and it turns out you get this answer of pi for every lattice. You get it for the triangular lattice as well if you do it on the cylinder but it's actually forbidden by symmetry. So the method was wrong, but the answer was right. Um, it's much better to do it on the torus. And eventually, we'll have a way of doing it analytically. So, OK, so finally, let me show you how we can take this. Um, so after all that work, you have the transformation properties of the magnetic monopoles. Let's do it on the square lattice to begin with. OK, and what you notice is that uh, there are these six monopoles. They're arranged in some weird way over here. I've thrown away half of them because they're not important. Uh, and what you notice is there is one particular monopole, which is a spin singlet, uh, which has no translation quantum number at all. Okay, so the way that worked is we got this Betty's phase factor of pi pi. Um, but then if I take this particular monopole and uh, you know, fill, um, let's say, both of them uh, on the right uh, and leave those two empty, the value gives me another pi pi phase factor. Together, they cancel. I get a monopole that actually can have thrown away all the other symmetry transformations. They're completely trivial, this monopole. Transforms as the identity representation of all the physical symmetries. OK, so that's allowed as a perturbation. And in fact, we can argue this happens for every bipartite lattice uh, theory. Okay, it's related to the fact you can go back to a SU2 gauge theory. OK, so now what you can do is um, we can complete our story. Uh, which is we had this first step. We got this mass term spontaneously by breaking symmetry. The next step is uh, we need to in introduce these magnetic monopoles. You can ask which magnetic monopole should I proliferate. So there's a procedure to do that. You have this particular mass term. This is the mass term we said gives you nail order. Okay, you pick the z direction of nail order. The tau z tells you it's staggered uh, between the sublattices, up and down. Okay, so now when you um, apply this on the monopole zero modes, this mass term actually picks out a particular monopole. It says the right value should be spin up, left value should be spin down. You can translate this into an operator. I won't go through that algebra, but you can translate this into an operator. And the monopole that you need to proliferate in this, uh, after you get this kind of symmetry breaking, is a combination of the trivial monopole and the one that transformed as the, the nil order parameter. OK, so sorry, I think I, I didn't mention this in the previous slide. Let me just go back. Um, so if you look at the six monopoles over here, there's one that's trivial. Of the remaining five, two of them transform like the valence bond solid order, and three of them transform like the nail order. Okay, and what this tells you, the thing that's picked out is the trivial plus the nail along z, okay, which is the same direction as the mass term picked out the nail along z. So basically what this tells you is you go through this procedure, at least for the square lattice, this additional step of monopole uh, proliferation does nothing, okay? because um, uh, it, the, the operators that you proliferate are either tri completely trivial in terms of symmetry, or they have the same symmetry as uh, the nail order that you anyway picked out by the master. Okay? So this whole procedure is kosher, it tells you, that you can say that the nail order came out of instability of the one spin liquid. Additional step of doing monopoles doesn't matter. Okay? So if this was the end of the story, it would be a little bit um, you know, uh, anticlimax. Um, but uh, it turns out things ha get a lot more interesting on the triangular lattice, okay? Because the Betty's phase factor is non-trivial, and we're going to see how this 120-degree state and this valence bond state appear, um, and because of this non-trivial Betty's phase uh, for monopoles on the triangular lattice. So let me go to this kind of formal way of uh, talking about how the symmetry gets implemented. So what this tells you is, for example, the translation symmetry. Uh, what we're saying is that the way it gets implemented is through a phase factor, e to the i 2 pi over 3, OK, when I translate by, let's say, along the one direction, times an operator that measures the magnetic charge, plus other stuff. This is for the triangular lattice. 
So this is what I'm calling Berry's phase. Maybe it's a terminology issue. I call this the Berry's phase. But, but I mean, why, why didn't it play a role in the square lattice? It also it, yes. Very good, yeah. So it actually does play a role, but indirectly. So T1 of the square lattice, we said, is e to the i pi times n phi. Um, sorry, nm, I call that. Sorry, nm. OK, but now it turns out this value of pi can, will combine with, uh, there's also this uh, SU4 part. right? So there's some stuff that comes from the flavor. And if you look at the different monopoles, they get combined together, depending on what the flavor of the monopole is. And there's one monopole where the two pieces cancel out. Because the flavor is also has wave vector pi pi. You, you can get that. If you have just the right occupied, you get the translation of this flavor gives you a minus sign. Um, and you can combine with this to give you a trivial monopole. The thing is, when you have 2 pi over 3, there's no way that can happen. The translation, the flavor, flavor translations are all, member, uh, all elements of SU4. They're all like plus 1, minus 1 phases. Or you know, maybe pi over 2. They cannot cancel off a 2 pi over 3 phase. What is the conclusion? If you have a uh, trivial monopole, that sounds to me like the topological symmetry will be broken completely. It will, that's right, yeah. So if it is a relevant operator, which is very likely, likely to be, you will flow away from the U1 Dirac spin liquid. Where you flow to can be debated, but the most natural assumption, if you just look at the symmetries and the anomalies of the theory, the most natural assumption is it flows to what's called this deconfined quantum critical point. But that's a conjecture that we can discuss later. I have one minute, actually. So, <laughs> um, um, Okay, so here the magnetic monopoles are going to play a very crucial role. Um, so again, here is the table. Um, so it looks like a bit of a mess, but there are two parts, the fermion mass terms and the magnetic monopoles, and these symmetric transformations have all been worked on. So this is work of uh, Shui Yang uh, Song. Uh, somewhat uh, non-trivial to do this, but uh, once you have this, you can you know, really go to town and ask all kinds of questions and have them answered. Okay? Um, so the first thing you notice is when you look at this transformation of the magnetic monopoles, uh, these are the spin triplet monopoles. These are the spin singlets. Uh, you see under translation, all of them pick up some non-trivial phase factor, okay, and also these guys. There's no way you can add a single monopole into your theory. Okay, the minimal monopole that you can add, which is symmetry allowed, is some product of three of these monopoles. That's the first conclusion. Uh, unlike the bipartite case, there's no trivial monopole, and um, you know, it's likely to be more stable. The U1 spin liquid itself is likely to be more stable. Next step is to get the magnetic order and the VBS order. Okay, so let's do that one by one. So we'll follow Chenke and uh, his friends. Um, first, what we'll do is we'll think of some spontaneous symmetry breaking, a mass term generation, followed by some monopole proliferation. This is the new thing we add. It turns out to be uh, important. Oops, I don't know why I had that. Um, OK, so first, which mass term should we proliferate to get the 120 degree order? So uh, Chenke and his friends identified that already there's a psi bar, sorry, the psi bar sigma z psi. This is what's known as a quantum spin hole mass term. Okay, so you imagine that this spontaneously occurs, you break the spin rotation symmetry, you pick out the z axis. Okay, that's the first step for this U1 spin liquid on the triangular lattice to get the magnetic orders. Okay, let's say you, this interaction is very strong, you spontaneously generate this. So you've broken the spin rotation symmetry, but actually this term doesn't break translation symmetries. So in itself, it cannot describe the 120 degree order. It also doesn't really pick out a phase in the plane. It's um, perpendicular to the spin plane. Uh, to get that, to get this complex vector kind of uh, order parameter, you really need the monopoles. Okay, and the monopoles have the right structure to do that. Um, so we have to, now our second step, we say we have to pick out the right monopole. With this uh, perturbation, the zero modes, you fill up the upspin on both valleys. Okay, it likes the upspin, do upspin on both valleys. You can translate this into a monopole operator, which is, turns out to be of the spin triplet monopoles, the second and third component, sorry, the first and second components. Phi 1, if you like, plus I phi 2, mod 3. And that is the third component that uh, was the quantum spin hole. So in the SX, SY plane, you pick out an order, and you can verify from this translation symmetry uh, that this is actually exactly the 120 degree order. You change the phase by 2 pi over 3. I mean, 2 pi over 3 is 120. That's 120 in the 120 degree order. OK, the somewhat non-trivial thing is you can also get this root 12 by root 12 state. Okay, and uh, very quickly, the mass term you put in now is purely valley, this tau 3. You go and do the um, 
zero mode filling, you end up filling uh, just the right guys over here. This turns out to give you some additional phase factors. Okay, so uh, uh, you take phi one and phi two, you have a different phase factor, not two pi over three, but pi over three. Okay, so that is um, thing. So um, if you go back to the Brillouin zone and see where these wave vectors lie, the transformation of the monopoles, these are the wave vectors you get for the transformation of the monopoles. Okay, and then if you fold the Brillouin zone, these are your new, new reciprocal lattice vectors, you get the smaller hexagon. Okay, and uh, you can see that the area of the smaller hexagon is one twelfth of the original Brillouin zone. Okay, just a quick way of seeing that root 12 by root 12 order has an area of 12. Okay, so 12 in real space, one twelfth in uh, momentum space. Okay, so we can reproduce both the nail and the VBS orders from this table of monopole transformation of the triangle lattice. You can do the same on the honeycomb and the Kagome, but I won't, I won't do that. Okay, so finally, this, there's this last part. Um, I don't know, what, what, uh, how much time do I? Two minutes? Okay, so uh, let me do it very quickly. Um, so the, this was kind of a bit of a shock for us that all of this very cool field theory kind of stuff can be related to some very, uh, you know, <laughs> old-fashioned Vanier physics of band structures. Okay, that's really the band structure of the spin-ons that's giving you this non-trivial Berry's phase. So somehow, band theory of these uh, objects is related to magnetic order, ultimately, uh, which is some deep connection, I'm sure, but uh, we can only make it very indirectly right now. Okay, so first, let me give you like a poor man's way of calculating these monopole quantum numbers. Okay, and um, the essential ingredient is what we're going to do is we're going to uh, think of this lattice and we're going to think of where the charges live on this lattice. Okay, so if I have a gap, I can make Vanier functions and put my fermions on certain sites. That's where the gate charge lives. And I'm going to be able to calculate the properties of monopoles within that background, uh, ch gate charged background, crystalline uh, background of charges. Okay, and um, what we'll do is we'll focus on rotations. Turns out you can generate everything from rota rotations, not reflections, but for example, translations you can generate from rotations by doing rotations around different centers, okay, opposite rotations around different centers. And the formula we'll use is that if I have a magnetic monopole of units strength, um, if there's an electric charge, let's say on the same site, uh, that combination gives me an angular momentum, which is the product. Okay, that's the only formula that I'm going to use. So let me very quickly give you a warm up, which is to do deconfined criticality for those of you who know, uh, know that. Um, so this is like doing the uh, Schwinger boson theory on the square lattice. Okay, and the gate charge pattern there, you can convince yourself as from these Dama models, kind of picture is a staggered pattern, plus minus on the square lattice. Okay, so let's see what happens when you put a, a magnetic charge over here. Um, you have uh, electric charge plus one, magnetic charge plus one. You'll get angular momentum plus one on the blue and minus one on the red. Okay, so if I do a rotation by, let's say, 90 degrees, two pi over four, the, angle, the monopole will get a phase factor of i, e to the i 2 pi over 4. Okay, but that's exactly how the valence bond solid order, pra order parameter transforms. Rotated by 90 degrees, it gets a phase factor of i. So this is the identification that magnetic monopoles in this deconfined criticality is really just the valence bond solid order. Okay, so this formula basically works once you get the gate charges right. Okay, but now we're going to do a more complicated example. We're going to go to the fermionic representation of spins. We have fermions moving around in this uh, band structure. We need to get the Vanier center. Somebody has to do that for you. And then we, but then we're going to, if I give you the Vanier centers, you can use this formula, and you can figure out how the monopoles transform. Okay, so, um, so now let's do it for this triangular lattice, which is our most interesting case. Um, this is the Dirac spin liquid and the triangular lattice. Um, and we take this band structure, we add some quantum spin hall mass term again to make it an insulator. The quantum spin hall mass term doesn't break any of the lattice symmetries because you equally occupy uh, the, two va um, the two valleys. Okay, you pick up spin for both. But anyway, that's a technicality. You get some gapped band structure. You don't worry about keeping track of the spin or time reversal. You get some Vanier centers. You can ask where do the Vanier centers live at the end of the day for these fermions. Okay, and here's the answer. The Vanier centers live on the sides, on the centers of the up triangle, and minus centers of the down triangle. So you can ask, what does this minus mean? 
<laughs> so this has to goes back to this idea of fragile topology. Sometimes, you know, when you have a uh, few number of bands, you cannot uh, accommodate all the representations with a small set of bands. But you can imagine taking the differences between band structures. Okay, so the way in which this was arrived at, we took our band structure, okay, the quantum spin all and the triangular lattice, and you find the representations of the uh, the energy levels at particular points in K space. Okay, so if you look at threefold rotation symmetry, it turns out that there are two points, the K point, K and minus K are, uh, you get the same answer, and the M point. Okay, there are three points in the Bilwa zone which are invariant under threefold rotations. And you go and look at the representation of rotations on those single particle states, the occupied guys. It turns out that you get two copies of this. So one and omega squared, you get two copies of. Okay, so we want to build that representation uh, from a band structure of, of fermions sitting at certain sites. Okay, let me just take one minute to write this on the board. I, it's impossible to do that on the transparency, so, so on the slides. Sorry. Uh, so the, um, actually I just erased the band structure, but the, the M point is really where the Dirac point was, and the K point is some other point in the Pilwa zone. So the, the target, the, the, what we want to get, uh, which is what we have from the band structure, okay, so this was our Dirac cone slightly gapped out. Okay, so this is our band structure, and we look at the representations at some high symmetry points. Let's say something like that. Um, and we, we have two times the representation one and omega squared. Okay, so we have to take, uh, this is some particle and hold. We just take this one and omega squared will spin up and spin down. Okay, two of them. We have to uh, get that from the so-called atomic insulators. Charges just localized at certain points in the lattice. Okay, and this uh, tells you what, what those representations are. Um, for example, for the site rotation symmetry, um, so this is some, you can forget about this factor, that's if the orbitals have some angular momentum. Uh, you see that for the up triangles, the down triangles, and, and this one, um, we're going to be interested in the K point. So let me just uh, do that. Um, so the site is, the representation content is 1, 1, omega, omega squared. The up triangle content is, I just read it off from here, uh, omega squared 1, omega, omega squared, and the down triangle guy is um, omega 1, omega, omega squared. Okay, and if I do take this formula, side plus up minus down, so I, I take the, I sum these and subtract this guy. Um, okay, I get 1, 1, um, the two omegas over here, so these omegas cancel, and uh, there are two omega squareds. Get omega squared, like squared. Okay, which is exactly this. It depends on the band structure. Yeah, right, right. But actually, suppose I take the type plus state, right? But if I, I can arbitrarily turn on some, some other band structure with zero. Okay, you ought to be a bit careful. Can you actually, do, if you have a specific model, we can analyze that. Right. But I'm not very sure you can just, yeah. For non interacting electrons, you can say exactly what you just said. Yeah. But for spin problems, you, it'll be good to make such a construction. But I, I'd like to see it. So, so you can change it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but in some very specific ways. Um, I mean, it may just be that those, okay, we'll, we'll, you'll see there are some cancellations. It may be that that cancels out. Okay. But anyway, this is how, just to tell you operationally, how we go from just looking at representations of band structure to a formula like this, okay? The, so the fermions, the itinerant fermions are, you can think of them as sitting like this. Charge one on the side, charge one on the up triangle center, and minus one charge on the down triangle center. Okay, now there's a background charge on every side of minus one to ensure gauge neutrality. So those guys will cancel against this. So you'll be left with just these two uh, at the end of the day. Okay, and uh, we want to see how this ends up giving us the two pi over three phase factor. That was the, the whole point. Okay, so that's very easy to do. Uh, now that you have everything set up, um, we're going to look at translations. Okay, and we want to translate by 
one unit and see that the phase factor we get is 2 pi over 3. Okay, that's this 2 pi over 3 over here. Okay, we want to generate this translation by two rotations. Uh, so what we do is say you have the triangular lattice. Okay, we're going to rotate around this point uh, by 2 pi over 3, followed by a rotation around this point, again by minus 2 pi over 3. Okay, the combination of these, there's no net rotation. They cancel out. There could be a translation. And of course, if I look at this point over here, it doesn't move under this rotation. Under this rotation, this point goes there. Okay, so this combination corresponds to a translation by this, the, the unit translation. Okay, so I just try to look at the difference in angular momentum for a monopole, um, you know, between putting it here, rotating, and putting it there, and rotating. And um, putting it on the site, I get no phase factor. Okay, because we said there is a charge on the site, there's a background charge as well which cancels it off. But putting it on the center of the up triangle gives you a phase factor that gives you the translation phase factor. Okay, so the numerics and all that was kind of redundant. You could have just done this. And you'll see that the translation phase factor is exactly 2 pi over 3. It's just a consequence of having these, these charges. Yeah, that was the the product. This, um, if I have a monopole, um, it is so we can talk about this more. But I was using this formula. Yeah, we can discuss. But it's essentially that you get different angular momenta, whether you're sitting, whether the charge is sitting here or there. The C3 quantum numbers was crucial. To, to determine where the one year can tell uh, for. To begin with. Yeah. And then I get the, um, yeah, OK. The C3 quantum number of the bands was crucial to get where the Van A centers are uh, like, yes. But after that, you don't need. After that, you don't need. You have the monopole in your hand. Mm -hmm. So let's say, I, let's say I put a monopole over here. I do this rotation. I don't get anything because there's no charge on that side. All the other charges are kind of equally distributed around. They won't, they won't change it. Then I do this rotation over here. Well, I'm taking a monopole, and if I did three times the rotation, I'd take it around this charge. I'd get 2 pi factor. But if I do it this much, I get 2 pi over 3. But this combination is exactly the translation. So translating a monopole gives you a factor of 2 pi over 3. And you can do all the others, reflection, et cetera, et cetera, which we spent the last month doing. <laughs> Yeah, that the, uh, so this is one third of the 2 pi rotation. Yes. So and you think that it's <coughs> uniformly distributed. Yeah, yeah. You can make that more rigorous if you want, yeah. Because you have a symmetry. You have this 2 pi over 3 is a symmetry. Mm -hmm. So you cannot have different phase factors on different legs. Okay, and uh, you can do the same. So now the key information anyone should give you is this kind of picture. Uh, and for the square lattice, you can work that out too. There are these. The band structure is staggered flux or pi flux and square lattice is charge plus one on the sides, plus one on the edges, and minus two on the plaquette centers. From this, you can get all the all of these transformation properties. That's all you really need to know. So, okay. So let me just f end. Sorry, I've gone a bit over time. The the one thing I want to discuss, which I think um, you know, this tells you is it may be um, that on the triangular lattice these U1 spin liquids may be more stable, and there's some indication of that in this Donner's numerics. There's some extended range in this J1, J2 model where there seems to be a, a gapless spin liquid. Okay, and uh, uh, this is J chi, which is not at play in our, uh, our discussion. That's the flux through the triangle. So let's just focus on this axis, J2 over J1. A fairly small value of J2 seems to give you uh, the spin liquid, and it seems to extend over some range of these couplings. Uh, in contrast, on the, on the square lattice, you need a fairly large value of J2. So maybe the isotropic, uh, the J1 only point is quite far from this transition. Um, and uh, there's some debate whether there is a phase or a point. Uh, so this is uh, some nice numeric expanders. The small region maybe of spin liquid. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, the question over here for the triangular lattice is perhaps even if I sit here at the Heisenberg point or maybe help it a little bit, 
uh, you know, maybe you'll see signatures of spin-ons, Dirac spin-ons, in the spectrum of the Heisenberg antiferromagnet on these on the triangular ladders. And actually, I don't know of good experimental examples of triangular ladders antiferromagnets that are not organics. <laughs> they can do neutron scattering and look at the spectrum. Do you know uh, which ones? Uh, like some. No, Okay, we should. Uh -huh. Yeah, if people can do neutron scattering. We can make, maybe make a prediction. So we had a prediction for Anders numerics for uh, the JQ model, one of the JQ models where you can use this staggered flux spin state to predict what the neutron scattering, uh, the structure factor would be. And something similar for the triangular ladders one could attempt with the drug spin liquid and see if spectral. Of course, this has a sign problem. So. You're restricted in what you can do, but maybe experiments or maybe uh, other kinds of numerics could, could look at that. But anyway, that is one of the thoughts we had that maybe triangular lattice Dirac spin liquid should be taken more seriously. It's hardly been looked at. Uh, okay, so let me stop here. What do you mean the frustrated square lattice? I mean like the J1, J2 model, it's not bipartite, but it's still the square lattice. Yeah, so sorry, yeah. What about the square lattice don't apply, but it's also not the triangular lattice. Yeah, so I should say this bipartite, I was really thinking about the kinds of orders that you get. Um, so the mean field theory that we write, uh, so it's really the question of the, that's J, J1, J2 is still the square lattice. Right. So maybe this, you can forget about the bipartite comments. Mm -hmm. The comment was for the, a lattice that could be bipartite. Right. Okay, but um, then you said that in that case we should only have an L and DBS, but we believe you know, there's a, some kind of gasless thing liquid. So yes, that is an interesting point, yeah. yeah. So you know, if, if this is a Dirac spin liquid, I find it hard to believe that Dirac spin liquid would be stable. If you have a trivial monopole, it's got a very relevant scaling dimension. Um, you know, maybe there's another candidate, or maybe you know, this, if you went to, I mean, you've gone to, to you know, big systems for ED, but or DMRG, but if you went to really big systems, maybe this would narrow into a, a point, which is the deconfined critical point. So we. Of we don't believe that, but of course, what can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know the scaling dimension of the spinning. We just know from n equal to infinity, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could be, um, you know, it, by some miracle, it could be stable. If I had to choose miracle, you know, monopole, so it irrelevant. It could have a small scaling dimension, so in numerics, yeah, there could be a crossover regime, basically. Um, and then you eventually go to deconfined criticality. Maybe that is a stable for critical point, so yeah. But I mean, have you really worked out everything you did uh, for frustrated <coughs> interactions? I mean, it looks to me like you just put this pi flux space, and uh, you know, maybe that's not what you should do when you have. Well, if you get a different spin liquid state, it would be interesting to analyze that. Yeah, you're right. If I put on a large J2, maybe there's a different U1 spin liquid on the square lattice that becomes preferred over the staggered flux. I'm thinking of the staggered flux not really changing much. When you put in J2, it's just tipping the balance between the VBS and the nail. Which one gets right. proliferated? It could, be something else. it could be something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that may have some non-trivial monopoles. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know of any others, but. Um, it may be good to, people have tabulated these things, so you can look it up. Yeah. Lateral yeah. yeah. Looking on the Turner space diagram, you might have, so there is chiral spin liquid. Yes, if you put J chi, yeah. Yes, if you could show in your description, do you see how it may Yeah. So um, offhand, I would say that putting in the psi bar psi, um, does that give you the chiral spin liquid? Yeah. yeah. The churn numbers work out. Yeah. That would give you the chiral spin liquid. So if the mass term psi bar psi is preferred. It's is, uh, less relevant than the others. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's the fermion bilinear. There's a fermion bilinear, which is, you know, if I give you graphene and I Haldane model mass term, 
if that is spontaneously generated, you will get into the quantum Hall phase. Here, I think what you do is you break the time reversal, right? Turner, is that right? Uh, yeah, you explicitly break the time reversal by putting in some flux through the up triangle and down triangle, different. So then maybe it's, you know, you don't have to spontaneously generate it. It'll just, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in a way, having chiral spin liquid here sort of uh, fits, fits with the having the Dirac spin liquid there.